In this podcast, we Ben from Contextually talks about relationship and the future of sales. So, stay tuned. Yeah. Welcome everyone to Work 2.0 podcast. Um, today we have with us Zweeban. Uh, he is the co-founder and CEO of Contactually, a leading CRM platform for relationship-oriented businesses and author of Success is in Your Sphere, Leverage the Power of Relationships uh, to Achieve Your Business Goals, uh, which is uh, published by McGraw-Hill. As a relationship marketing strategist, Zwee uh, has led the company to millions in venture backing and served tens of thousands of customers including eight of the nation's top 20 real estate brokers an engineer developer entrepreneur strategist and startup advisor zui has been named a washington tech titan four times and was finalist for ernst and young 2016 entrepreneur of the year award he was recognized among t360's um swaniopol power 2000 most influential leader and real trends game changers his work and expertise have been featured in New York Times, Washington Post, among other outlets. He lives in DC. And with that, Zui, welcome to the conversation. Thanks so much for having me, Vishal. That's a mouthful of background. I think beautiful. Why don't you walk us through what brought you to this point? Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, yeah, you can, you know, that's like 10 plus years of like work kind of condensed into a paragraph. and. So therefore, it sounds very impressive, but I promise I'm not that impressive. I mean, listen, at, at a core, um, I truly believe that relationships are our most important asset. And mm-hmm. I've devoted a lot of my time, you know, especially over the past, you know, seven and a half years um, to be able to help professionals build and maintain relationships. Interesting. And um, tell us about Contactually. What does this company do? Uh, yeah, so Contactually um, you know, is a CRM platform uh, built to help you nurture um, the most important relationships. I think, and especially for you know, everyone in the HR field, you know, you know that you know, the relationships between you know, yourself and employees, yourself and management, between employees and their managers, those are sacred. You know, people don't quit their jobs, they, people quit their managers. And mm. so that's such an, an incredibly important thing. And especially in this day and age where the knowledge gap is decreasing and the skills gap is decreasing, what we have left you know, as professionals is our reputations and our ability to build and maintain those reputations over time. The problem is human beings haven't changed, right? You know, We can still track only 150 or so people up here at any one point in time. Mm-hmm. So Contactually was built as software that helps us track the vast network of relationships that we have in our entire world, figure out which are the relationships that are most important, and then help us take action with the right ones at the right time. Interesting. Um, CRM, right? So I think if, 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 I, if I spend a few more, few more minutes on it, why, yeah. another, why another CRM? Like world is full of it. it. Why another one? Like what made you think that, okay, let me just get into this yeah, and honestly, like probably one of our bigger challenges was not whether or not we should build it, mm. but whether we should call ourselves a CRM, because once you do, mm. then everyone's mm. like, oh, well, there are a thousand other CRMs. You know, why does the world need a thousand and one? Um, what we saw was that, you know, for so many businesses, whether it's recruiting or HR or executive search or financial advisors consulting, you know, your business is not just about a straight transaction, right? Mm. And most CRM solutions are thinking about linear transactions. Mm. How do I go mm. from a lead mm. to a client? That's it. It's much more cyclical. You know, the people that you work with, you know, they may, you know, you may be working with them now, six months, six years from now. There might be a transaction opportunity, two months, two years, two decades. So what you need is you need a solution that's less focused on transactions and more focused mm. around relationships. And so we really set out Contactually as the key key idea behind relationship marketing. Um, and also part of that is that 
there's so much wealth of information around our relationships that most CRMs weren't picking up. So we built Contactually as a CRM that would track your email conversations and phone calls and text messages. And back in, back in the day, we were tracking all of your social media conversations. Um, that was something that we couldn't find tools to use. Otherwise, honestly, I probably would have just started using those. We couldn't find it. And so that's what set us out starting to build Contactually. I think um, very fair point. And even no matter which CRM you use, you always feel left out uh, for a major chunk of the business. So I, I do appreciate you stepping into this this sort of very wild ride. So what take us to the early days of um, when you said, OK, let me start build a company around this. Like what was that decision? What was the thought process? What brought you to this juncture of, OK, let me start coding this contextually yeah so uh, again we talked about like the core like uh, definition of the problem that relationships are important most crms aren't built around relationships they're built around transactions and so really i mean it, it was very simple it, it was starting off you know nothing more than an idea right we mm -hmm. all have ideas you know out there you know i made i was a little bit different that i captured that idea as as do i do with many other ideas so that was back in may of 2011 um, you know, and I think you'll know, like many startups nowadays that have seen success, you know, it wasn't necessarily any kind of watershed moment saying, Hey, we should mm. devote our entire lives to this for the next few years. Instead, it was like, Hey, this is an interesting idea. I wonder mm. what other people think about it. And so we started putting in front of like recruiters that we knew and financial advisors and real estate agents. And the resounding feedback was, yeah, this is actually pretty interesting that this is something mm. that people would benefit from. And so that kind of started us going down the path of starting to investigate this more and more. And, uh, you know, started building on the product, started putting the product in front of users, decided to incorporate, decided to raise a little, little bit of money. And kind of it was, it was kind of a slow build up into honestly where you see today, where we have, you know, at, at the time of acquisition, we had 70 employees, you know, doing eight figures in revenue, you know, raised $12 million in capital. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was an amazing experience. Awesome. And, and uh, what's your background, um, if, if I may ask? Like, what brought you to this, uh, this relationship-centered um, startup? Yeah, great question. I should not be talking about relationships because yeah. uh, I actually, at least I used to be a very introverted person. You know, the idea of even like having a video record of me was like a terrifying thing. Um, but however, early on in my career, uh, I stumbled upon this understanding that so many top professionals realize, which is that, again, you know, who you know, and more importantly, who knows you, mm. um, that's an incredible tool that can unlock amazing opportunities. And that happened, I went from being, uh, being a software developer at a large government consulting firm, just, you know, one of 1000s of engineers to being CTO of an enterprise software company that was acquired back in 2009. And then all of a sudden, I was working with the likes of Ford and CBS and Volkswagen, all these amazing companies, purely because I had the right reputation. And so that's what really set me out on this path to build software to help me build relationships initially, and then obviously now the greater world. And even writing the book, I never planned to ever write a book, but mm. we had just learned so much around relationship building that we said, hey, we just have to make sure this is captured in some way. And so that's what led us to that book project. Interesting. And um, I think, so when you're working on a CRM, you're working on the entire, like the critical business workflow of sales, right? So you're working very intimately with <clears throat> the conversions and all that fun stuff. So, and, and, and you are actually bringing a very beautiful point, which is lacking in, in I, I agree, like we use a CRM uh, ourselves and we realize that building relationships is a, still a very Excel CRM, like little, we have to use multiple tools to, to attain that kind of intimacy that a relationship yep. demand. So in your journey, what are, what are some of the things that you found um, fixable? Uh, through through CRM, which actually, because when you talk about relationship, relationship is a very, very qualitative phenomena, right? It's not a yeah. quantitative thing. And CRM just pretty much contain everything into a more quantitative phenomena where there's a lead, there's a, there's a goal, there's all that fun stuff. What were some of your some of your findings as, as, as you progressed in, in, in your journey? We'll resume after a short break. 
This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Yeah, you're right. I mean, a lot of people, you know, the general public thinks that, you know, relationship building is more art than science. Mm-hmm. And once we start to apply like structure and process and goals around our relationships, then all of a sudden we run the risk of sounding inauthentic that all we're trying to do is we're trying to like use people for, you know, for money, for our own personal gain. There's definitely that aspect. That being said, I think what we realize, and this is happening in so many other aspects of technology, is technology isn't replacing us. Mm-hmm. Technology is helping us be better humans, right? And that's where technology can really come into play when it comes to relationship management, right? So again, you know, uh, Robin Dunbar came out with this amazing piece of research that you know the average human being can only maintain around 150 mm-hmm. social relationships at any point in time. Mm-hmm. Well, that doesn't fly in this world mm-hmm. where you know, we can work with anyone around the world or anyone else in the world can work with anyone else around the world. And so, you know, all of a sudden the number of people that we can and have to connect with increases beyond the limitations of our brain. So technology therefore can come and step in, right? So Mm. it's not inauthentic to have a tool that is tracking all of your relationships and helping remind you of people that you've forgotten about as long as then you're the one actually doing the authentic outreach. Um, so that's a perfect example. Um, it, it's not unfair that you know, you're relying on tools to help you track all the notes you're taking on people, mm. right? You know, it's silly nowadays to think that, oh no, the only thing I can do is whatever I happen to remember up in my head around my relationships, mm. you know, I can. And even like artificial intelligence and machine learning can help us start to give a better edge, right? Again, if we're reaching out personally, there it's not a problem that, you know, tools can start to tell us like maybe the time of day that we should reach out to people, right? Mm. That we can see that, hey, Vishal seems to be responding to most of the most of his messages at 8.30 in the morning. So next time I, I reach out to him, I'll send him an email at 8.30 in the morning. So, you know, I, he sees my message first. You know, is that inauthentic? No, you know, it's mm. helping us build better relationships and be better human beings with each other. Interesting, beautiful point. And and from your vantage point, and uh, what would, how do you define a relationship uh, from the CRM context? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll say this. You know, uh, a contact is just their personal information, right? You know, mm. name, rank, serial, serial number, right? You know, first name, last name, you know, phone number, email address. You know, very basic information. The relationship is that actual bond and connection between you and I. The email conversations, the notes, the social objects, you know, the fact that you know, we started the conversation with you talking about how to pronounce my name. Mm. Um, the fact that you know, I like geodesic art and I can see that because I look over your shoulder and I can see the artwork on your wall, right? Mm. It's that kind of stuff that makes the relationship. So when we re-engage, you know, Vishal's not like, well, who are you to be? I don't even know or remember who you are and vice versa, right? I can get anyone's contact information nowadays and I can contact anyone, but it's that relationship, that bond between us, that's the real important asset that we want to be able to maintain. Uh, fair point, beautiful point. And now let's let's get on to, onto the meat of the stuff, the book, right? Yeah. So let's success is in your sphere. What exactly is this? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So you know, let me kind of give you a, you know, the background of the story. Um, with Contactually, again, we talked about why we set out to build it. Um, we set out because we know relationships are important. How can software help us build and maintain better relationships? And mm. we saw a lot of success early on, but we started seeing this really interesting pattern. And we spent time and time and time again trying to figure out what was going on. And we did our research and we talked to users about this. And the problem that we were facing is that people could understand how to use our software, but they couldn't understand how to use our software to grow their business. And the way I equate this nowadays is, you know, imagine that, you know, you, you, you want to be a great chef and you want to learn how to cook great food. 
if I were just to hand you a really great chef's knife, is that going to help you be a better chef a little bit? Mm. But it's actually how you use that knife and the knife skills and the cooking classes and the recipes that we give to you of how to use that knife. Mm. That's what really makes the most difference. And so what we learned with Contactually is that people needed that strategic framework in mind. They needed to understand, mm. okay, if I can have any relationships in my CRM and I can prioritize them in any way and I can send an email, well, what messages do I send? How do I add value? How do I prioritize my relationships? What contacts should join to my CRM? And mm. so we learned that there was a big piece missing in that CRM and that's what we set out to solve in the book. Interesting. And um, why this title? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I could say it's the catchiest, but it really came off that, you know, people saw their sphere of influence, you know, those, mm. that set of relationships as this gold mine. You know, people started thinking about this as an asset. You know, I actually know, you know, successful professionals who have been approached, you know, and being offered, you know, amazing sums of money just for their database, right? Um, such an amazing concept to be thinking about. And so, you know, that's why, like, you know, and it's taught by many of our partners that if you want to see success in your business, that success isn't necessarily by just going out and trying to get new leads and new leads and build new relationships. That success is already inherently in your sphere of influence. All you have to do is figure out how to be able to unlock and tap into it. Interesting. So one thing I was thinking about, so when you talk about relationships, right? So relationships are many times they are just relationships that we don't have and we have no tagged intentions behind it. We, we just, it's just something that we maintain. Now, when, when you, when we plug the word CRM and, 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 um, relationships, so we are giving it sort of some relationship, some intentions behind it, right? Yep. What has been your observation that would that would that impede someone from from progressing? What or or is it okay to create an intention, uh, give an intention to a, a relationship? No, I think it's actually the most important thing. I think you know the. I think far too often we see people falter because they're building relationships and networking without having a clear idea of what their intentions are. And so one of the key parts of the book that we start off with is. You, know, you have to be able to start off with identifying what your goals are. What mm. would be success? What would tell you a year or two years from now, yes, I'm getting what they want, what I want out of it. And it could be many things. It could be uh, investors. It could be more customers. It could be better employee retention. It could be better employee recruitment. Um, it could be so many things. There can be so many different ways of measuring. And so once you start off thinking about what do I want to achieve? Hmm. Then you can start identifying what you like, which types of relationships you want to focus on. Now, where people like oftentimes trip up is they enter in a specific relationship. Like if you hmm. and I were talking just now, hmm. they enter in a specific relationship only thinking about one thing. What do I get out of it? Hmm. And that's where, that's where we do have to face a shift and we have to think about how is this a mutual beneficial relationship? How does this relationship go beyond one single transaction and mm. become something that years or years and years from now, we might still be calling on each other and getting, getting value out of each other? That's, that's an interesting point. And, and one more thing I was thinking about. So I think when you talk about the social networks that are out there today, right? So Facebook yep. is there, LinkedIn is there, Twitter is there. They are somehow fudging with this idea of relationship, right? So yep. it's very difficult to now figure out who is like so it either it's it's messing with the intimacy level when so what 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 they call a relationship right so and you emphasize uh, uh, slightly on that particular element so how it is it impacting your side of the business or 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 the book that that you're like how is it impacting the way I deal with business when the relationship is losing its or at least the definition is losing its way and and we're finding a new one yeah I mean let's face it you know that's that's already happening right um technology again has been incredibly disruptive in that we can be connected to anyone but anyone can be connected to us you know one of the tips that i always say to start off with is you know pull up 
LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, any social network. And, you know, we used to think about that or like the initial definition of those was that it's like almost like a digital Rolodex, right? But your Rolodex would almost be by default, the people that you cared about in some way or would care about you, right? You know, there'd be only so many finite cards. Nowadays, we have thousands and thousands of LinkedIn connections, right? You know, hmm. the Lion, the LinkedIn open networking, uh, you know, kind of open networker kind of paradigm is super interesting because it's even further that. The problem is, well, who has our back and who's willing to work with us? Um, you know, one of the tests I like to say is you open up LinkedIn, pull up a random contact and ask yourself, you know, if they call me up tomorrow and uh, ask me for a referral. Or even something mm. as simple as twenty dollars, would I give it to them? Or worse yet, if I were in a position where I need a referral or I needed twenty dollars, would they give it to me? Mm. And so I think technology has allowed us to kind of increase the breadth of relationships we have, but at, that's at the cost of the depth of relationships with people who really have our back. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Interesting. I think so. I was thinking about one of the interesting problems that even we are facing at at our world. So we have um, a career development AI, right? So the AI's job is to connect people with the people who actually help me succeed in my professional career. And yeah. I think when we were building on the technology, we did a lot of surveys. And in the, in, in the survey, we asked professionals, hey, where do you, how do you find your professional buddies, right? And more often than none, it's 15 feet from their cubicle, right? So how are, are they impacting your career progression or not? That's, that's sort of, right? So then we realized, okay, Maybe people are not equipped to connect relationships with the idea of career progression, right? So they, when you say, hey, buddies, maybe it's it's the same ethnicity, ethnicity you're looking at. Maybe it's the same town that you're from you're looking at. So we're not very good at picking relationships that actually help us progress. Um, what has been your observation on your end? Like, how do you fix this problem? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it, it does come down to um, to focusing on Again, building that entire database, hmm. um, figuring out all the people you know, and then with your goals in mind, trying hmm. to identify the exact types of people that will be most helpful. You know, oftentimes, you know, we're, we surround ourselves with, first off, you know, the people who are just you know, in physical proximity or always talking to us. Um, hmm. But if we're actually more intentional, we might change who we're networking with, right? So for example, one of the things for me is, I want to make sure that I build a network of really successful founders that I can learn from in the next couple of chapters of my career. Mm. Well, that's very different than the people who are like immediately right. surrounding me in the office. Right. Um, that's very different than you know, the top 50 people in my inbox. I actually have to dig deep and find relationships that I haven't talked to sometimes in years to, to reinvigorate and re-energize those relationships. So I think that's why we have to stay rooted in what are we trying to achieve and mm. then rating out where the people that can most impact us. And that's, I think, where in artificial intelligence you know, and tools like yourself is so incredibly interesting because mm. it can help us identify relationships that we wouldn't otherwise know um, or even information about our relationships that we wouldn't otherwise be able to understand. Interesting. So, so um, what I'm hearing is, for, even from your perspective, that you would see even the idea of relationship change from the context. So, if I'm if I'm talking about say professionals, or if I'm talking to sales, that then the relationship should somehow help and support this notion of sales or whatever. Right? If I'm if I'm at home, that so basically we will end up having one more dimension to a relationship matrix. That is very what you're doing, and and, and at that particular time, is, is is that what 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 you're saying? Yep, absolutely. Interesting, interesting. So um, now it's, I think so. Talk about some of the some of the research that you did uh, while while writing this book. Yeah, you know it's funny. Uh, you know, 
obviously like we've learned an incredible amount of working with you know such amazing talented people like are you our customers and users but mm. we kind of were looking for like some you know, a little bit more substance a little more backing behind uh, all this work and so um you know what so we dug into like a lot of different things that honestly we talked about today like the fact that you know um Cigna did a survey uh, you know health insurance company in the United States did a did a survey and it found that out of you know uh, the 20,000 people that surveyed, uh, nearly half of all Americans um, mm. felt lonely. Well, that's kind of crazy with social media mm. these days. You know, we are connected to so mm. many people. Like, why do people feel lonely? Um, or according to the National Association of Realtors, 88% uh, of buyers say they'd work with their agent again, but only 12% mm. uh, actually do. And so mm. that kind of helped kind of really frame that, okay, mm. clearly technology is helping us be connected to people, but mm. are we actually connecting to people more and more? Um, that's kind of where like research really started to kind of paint more of a clear picture that honestly, so many of us like kind of were feeling in our heart. Uh, all of a sudden the research was confirming that like, yeah, this is kind of what's really happening. Interesting. And and what, what were some of the surprises that you end up seeing uh, while working through this book? Some of the things that you never anticipate um, or some of the results that, that, that you, you were just... <laughs> reverse with yeah absolutely um you know one of the things that i i really love is uh we made a lot of effort in you know trying to dig into like real tactics like things mm. that people could do nowadays um like exactly today getting off this call getting off this meeting uh reading one chapter um to be able to help build and maintain their business um mm. and through, through that we spent a lot of time you know talking to users um, and you're know, talking to top professionals and networkers uh, and relationship builders about what they were doing and a number of really exciting, you know, stories, pieces of research or other trends. I, I'll share two of them. You know, I think mm. the first is kind of small tactical. The second is kind of a much bigger trend that I think we should really talk about. Um, mm. The first is uh, there is this kind of story about the Benjamin Franklin effect. And uh, what Benjamin Franklin did and learned that if you want to build a relationship with someone such that they value you, um, it seems counterintuitive, but maybe start off with asking them for a favor, right? So Benjamin Franklin mm -hmm. like was trying to trying to you know work with a, another lawmaker that he was at odds with, and uh, he asked flat out, um, you know, just to borrow a book, right? It seems harmless, but that kind of stuff changes the relationship because all of a sudden, like you know, your brain is wired to, you know, to like the people mm. that you're helping. And so if you, you know, if you're solicited for help, you know, naturally that, you know, that mind, you know, your mind changes. It's also called like the Ikea effect, funny enough. Mm. Um, <laughs> the bigger trend though, that I thought was interesting. And I actually wrapped the book with this. If anyone wants to buy the book and kind of skip to the very end mm. is that every single professional that we talk to, when asked what their kind of biggest key to success was, is their willingness to try and fail. That they had made so many mistakes, and but what ma mattered is that they were able to pick up from them those mistakes and maintain momentum. Very interesting and very, mm. very counterintuitive. And that's actually what stops most people. And again, what we saw with Contact is that people would say, hey, I don't know which people to reach out to, so I'm not going to reach out to any of them. Or mm. um, I want to do this every single day, but I haven't gone into my CRM in a month, so I'm not going to go do it at all. Or I don't know what to say to this person, so I'm not going to say anything at all. And instead, it's actually being able to get across that path and say, hey, I'm going to do something no matter what. It may not be the right thing, but it's something. And from that, they're able to learn and try and fail and iterate and learn and iterate and got to the point where they are today. Interesting. And and one more thing, I think you briefly mentioned about that you were introvert to begin with, right? And and I, I'm yep. coming from that that bandwagon it's, uh, as well. And it's very difficult for introverts to reach out to sort of to uh, start a relationship or get on a relationship bandwagon. From from your vantage point, what are some of the things they could do um, that to get them start to get them started in building meaningful meaningful relationships? Yeah, actually, and one of the funny things is, uh, and um, uh, Daniel Pink brought this up in his book uh, "To Sell as Human." That actually turns mm -hmm. out that introverts are sometimes some of the better salespeople 
Um, mm. And I think, you know, and as, you know, as the our research and inter, um, interviews showed is that, you know, a lot of like the, the best networkers or best relationship builders, they're not necessarily extroverts. They're actually like really good, you know, just they're actually really introverted people that would much rather be by themselves, mm. but they know that relationships are important for them. And therefore they, like, they can be much more intentional when it comes to actually building those relationships outbound. Super fascinating. So I think therefore, you know, what you and I have to do as introverts is mm. just think strategically, like come up with a recipe and follow it. Right. Um, and that comes to like, you know, in, when be, if we're afraid to reach out, well, step one might be come up with a few email templates to use. Mm. Um, and then when we're reaching out, we're not, we're not figuring out, oh, oh my God, what do they think about me? I'm afraid to reach out. It's simply saying, hey, which of these three predetermined messages am I going to send to that person? Mm -hmm. um, coming up with that, it, it's thinking about small little tricks. But, you know, again, but it goes back to that, you know, idea. And I love this, uh, I love this phrase as a blog post by uh, uh, a venture capitalist I respect, you know, label like most people won't. Um, mm. And that's true. Like most people are afraid to act. Most people get to the point where you and I do where we say, hey, I don't know what to do or I want to start a podcast, but, and there are very few people that are actually willing to cross over that line from fear into action. And if we're able to do that, then great. We have the world to ourselves. Fascinating uh, uh, idea. I think that that's, that's a great, great thought. And thank you for sharing that. So uh, I think, what are some of the things that you are pleasantly surprised with or like when, when when you when you talk to people about their relationship strategies what are some of the things that you are like you said okay i, I don't expect that and uh, some of the maybe common mistakes that these guys are doing or oh, if you yeah, could share absolutely. I mean, they're... we'll resume after a short break this part of the podcast is brought to you by first friday fair fastest ai powered way to find your next opportunity check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. There's so many mistakes. What I've loved is like the little different tactics to stand out. Mm. For example, uh, I know a, a real estate agent in Chicago that uh, her way of building a relationship is that she, uh, you know, that for example, before Valentine's Day, uh, a few weeks, few weeks before Valentine's Day, she'll call all the top restaurants and get reservations at them. And then mm -hmm. offer that to her clients, you know, the day before Valentine's Day, saying, "Hey, by the way, I know you've been busy. Did you forget to book a reservation for Valentine's Day? Hey, choose one of these restaurants. Yeah, I'll give it to you. Wow. Cost them nothing, but again, great way of building value. Um, mm. Or you know, or when it comes to, uh, or there's a uh, um, there's a guy Chris Shembra in uh, New York who runs a series of dinner clubs, and those dinners are you know are really popular and really great. But he, um, but he really makes a big impact in trying to build and maintain that personal connection with people. Um, mm -hmm. And so he focuses on the questions that he asks the audience and that they uh, share with each other. So small little things like that can do that. So it's not necessarily the big crazy ideas that make a difference. It's the mm -hmm. small little tactics. You know, the instead of you know, instead of uh, just sending a thank you note, recording a piece of personal information and leveraging that personal information when you go to follow up. It's not just saying thank you, you know, right after a meeting, it's saying thank you three months later. You know, so it's a lot of small like nods and tweaks, again, through that constant, you know, constant effort of trial and error that you can really learn. Interesting. I think, so I was thinking about one of the conversations that I had with one of the, um, very early entrepreneur uh, building a company in in sales domain and, and they have some good clients and and he was telling me some interesting insights so he was telling me vishal you know what what's happening nowadays sales so sale is uh, pretty much a replica of the processes that that this company follow and the sales the pattern and the sales cycle they all follow the same thing and because of the automation the sales itself is getting so automated nowadays that he, he said that maybe we need technology uh, in some ways and the, the idea of relationship would be just finding a resonance between my sales cycle and their sales cycle and 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 cracking that net open 
from your vantage like what what do you think because you are actually working on a very interesting problem into this right relationship is at core of sales and just we we are bad at edit somehow we need a tool we need a we need a mindset yep. what's what's your observation into this yeah um really great question i'll, I'll kind of answer it a slightly different way and that you're right I think this is, goes back to this kind of, you know, we're in this arms race of technology and mm. so much of sales is being automated, but that also means that as it gets automated, it lowers the barrier to entry. So, right. you know, email automation, for example, there's been this explosion of email automation tools. Um, well, through that, that means that our clients are getting bombarded with more and more email communication. Mm. Well, how do we stand out from that? And that's why, again, as the knowledge gap decreases, as the skills gap decreases, as even the communication gap decreases, what allows us to stand up? Someone asking you, Vishal, hey, Vishal, do you know a really great CRM? And you able to say, hey, actually, like I spoke with Spi, I think you know, it's a really great CO CRM. Actually, I think you should check it out. Um, or me asking you, know, you know, or someone asking me for your tool. And I can say, oh yeah, no, like Vishal, again, great entrepreneur, highly recommend working with him that kind of stuff makes such a big difference another mm. key aspect of sales that is changing is you know it used to be sales was kind of you know the you know um all about like to always be closing and mm. just getting someone you know just getting someone to sign the deal and then who cares it's someone else's mm. problem well now in the world of you know of, so of software as a service it's not the initial sale that matters it's the renewal mm. and expansion that matters. And so it's on us to make sure it's a lot more important to nurture that relationship for a long period of time. Because otherwise, you know, the salesperson is getting their feet held to the fire if they bring on a client that turns out to be a nightmare and turns out after a few months. You know, same with uh, HR and recruiting as well, right? Mm. HR is now as much focused around employee retention as they are mm. in recruiting. You know, it used to be you hired someone and the expectation is that they would stay on for, you know, a decade or more. And now it's like, well, 18 months later, why am I still at this company? And, you know, that, you know, and that people managers have to be a bigger and bigger part of the conversation around, you know, why an employee, you know, should stay at this role. Interesting. And so from your vantage, if, if I'm a company and, and, and I want to get into this idea of relationship uh, based marketing, what are some of the things you would suggest me to change? Like, what are some of the things you could say, some baby steps that I could actually tactically, I could execute on and seeing success or at least see some success? What would you yeah, say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the fun little tasks that we always say is to open up your phone, um, pull up five random people that you haven't spoken in a while and literally just say, hey, just thinking about you, hope all is well, talk soon, period watch the responses come in and you'll be mm -hmm. amazed every single time what happens from those small little actions now from that if you start to see interesting responses then it's about how do you scale it and that's mm -hmm. why i think you know, step one is identify what your goals are step two build some kind of database whether you use a crm mm -hmm. or an excel spreadsheet or a stack of business cards on your desk whatever you use just like try and build your relationships at any one point in time and the last thing is, and this is something we didn't talk too much about, but you know, where most people fall short on is relationships are a long-term game that will benefit us over a long period of time. Hmm. Short term, what are we trying to do? And how do we make sure that what we're doing will benefit us in the long term, not the short term? And so that's why you know, one of the important tools that we say is, hey, just book time in your calendar every week for an hour and your sole job and the sole thing you're trying to do is just proactively building relationships without mm. any expectation of something coming in any short period of time. And you'll be amazed by what comes out of that. Interesting. And um, I think one thing I was thinking about, so when you, when, you, when, you took, when you talk about new generation that are coming into this workforce, they are very social media savvy, I would say. They are very attached to their devices that's something that they would associate with um and and obviously that's why we have more uh, depression going on and uh, uh, other other effects how is that impacting the idea of relationship because when you, when these these youngsters get into the workforce they're already leading and and getting into the workforce 
how is it impacting uh, because they are not used to the typical idea of call like it's 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 funny that uh, why i was thinking about this uh, i was working for a non profit and um, i asked bunch of my uh, sort of uh, team members to start calling for so we can we can do the fundraising round for this particular uh, non profit and they were having hard time in picking up a call and calling because they said this is not our culture i am more than happy to text to 70 people rather than just call to once it 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 was just like a mindset shift that i realized that, okay what's your take on that like how is that changing the idea of relationship and how is uh, what what are you seeing from your end no oh, you're you're absolutely right and you're kind of hitting on a very very interesting thing that i think technology does has not just changed you know the breadth of people um that we connect with but it's also changed how we relate to each other um and you know uh, this is silly but you know there's been uh, you know one of the things that we've heard throughout this you know as we were kind of doing research for the book is that something like this needs to exist because we've forgotten how to build relationships right that you know we're human beings we have more connections with random facebook friends you know in other countries than we do with our own neighbors you know people who live mm. on our street and so there's this kind of need and is coming up growing force and need to just even learn like how to be human again and how to be tribes people you know human beings are are wired to need social mm. connection mm. and you know we're kind of missing that nowadays interesting and so uh, when you were writing this book who would like what what was a typical audience uh, who would be a typical typical reader that that you envisioned while, while while writing this book yeah i mean so i think it's anyone who can say that hey their ability to build and maintain relationships is a key part of their job um now of course you know, you know we think about people in professional services financial advisors consultants real estate agents you know uh recruiters and talent search uh leaders um executives um you know entrepreneurs um but it can also be anyone who you know is in a period of time where they need to build relationships you know mm -hmm. if you're trying to raise venture capital for your business if you're trying to raise donations for your nonprofit or your religious organization um if you're trying to find a job and you think that relationships are going to be your best path in um that's really where it can be applicable so there it's one of the kind of cool things and honestly one of the burdens um is that uh this book could apply to so many different types of people interesting and and what's next on this book like did there would there be a sequel to this or what 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 do you have in mind yeah you know funny uh, gr great question i've been asked that before um i don't have a follow on to this plan right now you know i i wrote this book because we you know we've learned so much and i wanted to, it to be something that lasts longer than you know our software um so i'm kind of you know i'm putting this out in the world um if people are interested in this great if not glad i didn't invest any more time in it um if you know there's so much demand that people are thirsting for some kind of follow on book to it um mm. i'd be happy to write it and i'd be happy to update it um right now i'm interested in seeing kind of you know again will people value this i mean a personal story uh, when i uh when we first kind of uh signed the agreement uh with a uh, with mcgraw hill to publish the book mm. you know all of a sudden i was can cuz hit with this see oh my god like is this going to book is this going to be a book that our kids will one day read and gain mm. value out of and mm. so it put a lot of gravity on us that's that's pretty pretty awesome man um by the way thank you so much for walking me on on the book um at this point like i want to spend a few minute on your journey right so yeah. uh, this is the tail end of the conversation and i want to spend some time on your uh, your path as well so we ask all of our guests to share uh, some of the traits that has helped them stay successful throughout the revolution like what would you attribute a success to which qualities that has really helped you shape what you are today yeah so i would say that there are uh, two key qualities um that i think if i did some soul searching uh one is uh, a bias for action um that i definitely have not been the smartest person in the room i definitely have been not made the best decisions but what matters is that every day you know um i and the team that we built maintained forward momentum 
That meant mm. that I could be rejected by five investors in a day. Um, doesn't matter because I would go to sleep and wake up the next morning and go and pitch the six. Um, mm. You know, it's regardless of how many it, uh, customers challenges we had, we would never say nope, I'm done. We would just say, all right, let's let's figure out some way to inch forward. And the other part of it is, um, and I think you know, many leaders would share this too, is um, always making sure you're the dumbest guy in the room. Hmm. Um, it's no joke that you know my engineers uh, don't even let me near the code base anymore. Um, and I built the first version, but they've hmm. surpassed me to such levels that hmm. they don't even want me looking at the source code anymore. Um, so uh, I think those key traits have been important for me. Interesting. Um, and I think one thing that we ask all of our guests to share is some of their favorite reads, some of the books that has shaped them or they like reading. Like, do you have some some books that you want to share? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, three books stand out uh, more importantly. Um, one is uh, Ben Horowitz's The Hard Thing About mm. Hard Things. Mm. Um, that's been a, a really great book. And I think mm. any entrepreneur, any business leader, you know, if you get one thing out of it, I think it's that, mm. hey, you're not alone, that mm. you know, there are a lot of other people that have struggled through this, a lot of people that seem a lot more successful. Mm. Um, Jeffrey Moore's uh, Crossing the Chasm um, mm. was a critical book for us. Um, the TLDR on that is that, you know, if you really want your company to be successful, um, you know, you have to take your group of early adopters and focus mm. on a particular niche to move from early adopters to early majority. Uh, I don't think it actually be around if it weren't for that. And then uh, a later book that I think is much more interesting is uh, uh, Yuval Noah Hariri's uh, Sapiens. Mm. Mm. Um, it's a fascinating, and I, I, I'm honestly, I've never been interested in the sciences. I've never been interested in sociology. So to pick up a book and kind of gain that like the bigger view of like humanity overall uh, is really fascinating read. I think great, great choices there. And, and thank you for sharing that. I think they, they would be really, really useful. Um, so as a close closing remark, uh, last but not the least question for, uh, for you, if you want our listeners and viewers to take away something from this conversation, like what would that be? What would be your closing remark to them? Uh, if your relationships are your most important asset in your career, in your job, in your life, um, underscore that asset part. And just mm. like the dollars in your bank account, it's something that can go up. It can something go down. It can be invested in. It can be neglected. And so come up with a strategy to grow and maintain that asset moving forward. With that, um, Zui, thank you again so much for spending time with us, sharing your insights on relationship marketing. If 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 people want to learn more, uh, besides, so I will put the link for the book um, on on description for listeners and viewers. If they want to read something more about your company or 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 the work that you are doing, where, where could they find it? Yeah, for the book, uh, you could just go to successisinyoursphere.com. Or uh, just you know, go on Amazon or Barnes and Noble and just look up "success is in your sphere." Uh, contactually is just uh, contactually.com. So that's contact and actually, if they had a baby. Uh, mm. And my name's V Band. Uh, luckily, there's only one me. So if you uh, do a quick search, uh, I'm gonna be pretty high up there in Google results. That that's a very clever uh, clever name. So I think it's it's it's, it's sometimes even I feel even in some of the Indian names are very unique, and I envy those guys. I think I, I remember that uh, during early days, someone said, "Vishal, you know what? If you want to see if you're good enough, just Google your name and see if you're on the first page." And somehow my name is not. It's it's one of the very common name in India, and I had a freaking nightmare in getting myself on the page page one. And this guy was like, it's it's like a, and at that point I had no understanding of whether how much effort it takes. But I think uh, joke aside, thank you so much. We uh, it was remarkable and it was it was pretty useful. I really appreciate. It. I, I honestly hope your listeners uh, you know gain value out of this conversation. At least one thing you can act on today. And if not, let me know and I will do whatever I can to help you.
Beautiful. And and uh, you're always welcome back on the podcast if you have any other stories to share and, and, and wish you nothing but success with the book. And we'll put we'll put the link and we'll also join um, uh, your fan follower to promote your book and, and, and let our listeners and viewers know. And even any way we could be of help in your uh, helpful in your success journey, do let us know as well. Really appreciate that, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick. Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick. I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here. Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it. And I go into the booth feeling nervous. Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless. Is the mic gone? I don't know how to work this. Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on the side.